Good morning, everyone. <laughs> and welcome to the 32nd Annual Kitsap County Conference for Human Rights. This year's event centers around this is our home, our bodies, our communities, our planet, and looks at these topics from a human rights perspective and how they intersect and impact others, each other. We're going to start off today by introducing the members of the council. My name is Dion Deshan. I'm the chairperson for the Council for Human Rights and I represent District 1. I'm Judy Friesen. I'm also in District 1. Good morning, everyone. My name is Erin Lanham. I'm the secretary for the council and I also represent District 1. Good morning, everybody. My name is Christina Barone. I represent District 2. Good morning. My name is Chris Ambergy, and I'm in District 3. I'm Marlena Simmons, and I represent District 3. My name is Elizabeth Holmes. I use she, her, and they, them pronouns, and I represent District 3. Hi, good morning. I'm Kirsten Dahlquist, and I represent District 3. Good morning. My name is Greg Nebel. I'm an at-large counselor. Um, I live in Paulsville. Good morning. My name is Susie Beal. I am a vice chair of the council and I am also an at-large member uh, living here in Bremerton. Well, welcome all. We're so glad to see you all this morning and thank you for making the time for this conference. We want to begin with our Linda Gabriel Awards presented by Judy Friesom. Yes, good morning. This is always an honor. Um, every year we um, acknowledge people who have done extraordinary work in Kitsap County. And the Linda Gabriel Awards were started in 2014. Um, that's when um, Linda Gabriel, who was a founder of the Kitsap County Council for Human Rights, passed away. So your, your friends and neighbors have nominated people. We have four categories, Youth, Adult, Organization, and Lifetime Achievement Award. And on the certificates, which will be mailed out to everybody, it says for extraordinary commitment and dedication to our communities, infusing human rights awareness and improving the quality of lives of people of Kitsap County. So may these in recipients inspire all of us and think about who you might want to nominate for next year's awards. So I had the honor of presenting the Youth Award to Mayor Pasquale. She's someone I would love to get to know. Hi, Mayor. I haven't met you yet, but I would love to know. Two people have nominated Mayor. Am I saying your name right, Mayor? Yes. Yeah. Two people have nominated Mayor, um, and I can see why. Um, she just graduated from um, CK, Central Kitsap. And while she went to high school, she also did running start and got her AA degree. Two main, what I'm understanding here is that there are two main, um, there's some background noise, if people could please mute yourself, that would be great. Thank you. Two main efforts. One was with K-A-I-R-E, CARE, Kitsap Advocating for Immigrant Rights and Equality, where she has been a core leader to mobilize immigrant and migrant and their descendants, their rights to bring their voices to the table and mobilize a platform to achieve equity. And her other strong commitment has been with Students Direct Equity, which is a Kitsap Erase Coalition campaign to raise youth voice and to make sure that equity plans, programs, and staff of local school districts are truly accountable to students. In addition to that, besides going to high school and getting her AA degree, she was involved in the Environmental Club, the Gay Straight Alliance, the Asian American and Pacific Islander Club, Stop Survivors Support Through Outreach Prevention Club, and the Washington Youth for Climate Justice in Seattle. And this is one person we're talking about. <laughs> Just remarkable. So um, it sounds like you're a leader, Mary. And what I love most about what I've read is that you've really highlighted the importance of community. That though you are a strong leader, you have with seeming humility acknowledged all the people who've been supporting you and continue to walk alongside. Um, so you give me hope. And if you'd like to say a few words, I thank you so much for your dedication. Yeah, I thank you so much. I am very grateful for this award. Um, 
it's kind of highlighted everything that I've done in the past years. And it's like a payoff for me, like a weight uh, lifted. So I'm really grateful for my parents for always supporting me, driving me around when I couldn't drive my own car. Um, and my abuelos for showing me what it means to be like living here, but still making a difference in community. And that's so important to me. So thank you. Thank you. I should say that I'm passing this to Marlena, who's going to um, acknowledge the adult Linda Gabriel Award. Thank you so much, Judy. I am truly honored to have the privilege to introduce the adult recipient of this year's Linda Gabriel Award, Erin Lighting. Erin is a brilliant community organizer working to move race equity forward, always coming alongside and in service to the leaders of color in our community. His embodied understanding of how to work with, with humility as a white-bodied man in a culture conditioned in white supremacy leads him to organize in ways that not only reduce harm, but model for others who watch him. He works in a collective, collaborative way, teaching and bringing others alongside. In some ways, the how of what Aaron models seems as important, if not more important than the list of the things he has organized and accomplished. And the list of what Aaron has done is long and not limited to the following. Aaron is one of the many co-founders of the grassroots community organizing group, Kitsap Showing Up for Racial Justice, and has helped to sustain Kitsap Surge's focus of calling out more white people off the sidelines and into the work of undermining white support for white supremacy. Since 2016, Kitsap Surge has been a place where everyone is interested in this work, can build the relationship, skills, and analysis needed to act for change through Kitsap, for change. Through Kitsap Surge, Aaron and others worked with Chuck Tanner of the Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights to write the report, Threats to a Welcoming Kitsap, Xenophobia, Racism, and White Nationalism in Kitsap County. Aaron and Chuck have presented this report to most multiple Kitsap area civic organizations, community groups, governmental jurisdictions, and other entities. Each presentation has included analysis and tools to those in attendance that can, so that those in attendance can apply to root out and dissemble systemic racism and white supremacy in their particular realms. Aaron has also been active in Kitsap E-Race Coalition since it was first convened in late 2019 by Akuye Karen Vargas. He helped to facilitate establishing the basic structure and core practices of this coalition, which gathers together different groups and organizations that share a commitment to race equity and community engagement. He is a key, he was a key organizer of the coalition's 2020 massive collect, collective action in Bremerton, Paulsbo, and Bainbridge Island, which amplifies the message of Black Lives Matter and Native Lives Matter in the wake of police killings of George Floyd, Tony McDade. Brianna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Stone Child Chief Stick, and so many others. He has been active in the coalition's Reimagine Public Safety campaign, which has pushed for a no BIPD expansion, raising community objectives to effectively tripling the footprint of carceral systems in Bainbridge. As the lead of the coalition's governmental jurisdiction team, Aaron coordinated an in-depth li listening and collaboration session between all coalition team leads and Dr. Karen Johnson, the director of Washington State's Office of Equity. This work has taken forward, was taken forward by Dr. J to inform the governor's 2022 equity summit, as well as the vision for institutionalizing equity across the state in the years to come. Since 2017, Aaron has been a part of the Juneteenth Freedom Festival community planning team, this team plans Bremerton's annual event now in its 20th year, started by Robert Body, J.D. Sweet, and others in the Community Leadership Coalition and Alliance. The festival commemorates Juneteenth on June 19th, 1865, the actual day that chattel slavery in the United States ended over two years after the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. Aaron also serves on the City of Bremerton Race Equity Advisory Committee alongside fellow community members Daryl Riley, Faye Flemister, Celie Quisano, uh, Glenna Mattinson, Aaron Burroughs, Sarah Van Gelder, Laomi Prasado, and Dr. Karen Bolton, who have worked collectively to hold the city government accountable to truly accessing its own policies, practices, and organizational culture through a race equity lens. Aaron and Bremerton reacts Change the Power working team organized the March 2022 public forum, Getting to Racial Equity to Build Upon 
Getting to Racial Equity built upon in-depth interviews with local community leaders of color and giving their reoccurring feedback to the city alongside additional community input and prioritization of actions the city could take to institutionalize racial equity. Erin has amplified the voices of youth who are often shut out by systemic racism, xenophobia, ableism, heterosexualism, cisism, adultism, and inequities. He has supported youth leaders like Mayor Pasquale, Ali Polito, and Guylan Charles in groups and organiz organizations like Kitsap Ag Advocating for Immigrant Rights and Equity, Luminous Minds Project, Living Life Leadership, and Kitsap Black Student Union, among others alongside Annie Sayo, Promise Partner, Jewel Shep Shepard Sanson, and other adult allies, he has facilitated political education and organizing skills development for youth and campaigns like Student Direct Equity, which organizes and advocates for all local school districts to have equity plans, programs, and staff that are truly accountable to students and to community-based organizing. So without further ado, I present to you Aaron Light. Hey everybody, thank, thank you, Marlena. Hey, Mayor, um, um, my name is Aaron and um, I'm honored to be here today and especially to um, speak after Mayor and accept this award after Mayor because we have gotten to work together for the last few years and it's been amazing. Um, I just want to take a second to thank the council for all their work on the conference and all the things they do all year long and just everybody for being here because without um, our collective effort and you know lifting up all the things that are going on that don't often get acknowledged this work wouldn't go forward so thanks to everybody for everything you're doing in community I see so many faces on this call people who are doing so much and I appreciate you all have a great conference thank you so much Aaron and now I will pass it over to Kirsten who will present the organization award Good morning, everyone. I am honored to present the organization award this morning. And the recipient is the Up From Slavery Initiative. And I'd just like to share a little bit about the uh, initiative. So their mission is to heal, inform, and empower marginalized and underserved communities. The initiative creates a pathway to freedom with three distinct goals in mind. Number one, that's financial literacy through empowering individuals to take control of their personal and business finances by understanding their history and the important of pro importance of proper money management. Goal two is addressing racial justice and injustice against brown and black communities specifically bringing awareness to systemic racism, racial profiling, stereotypes, and biases. Lastly, the initiative brings awareness to individuals' personal health, mental health, and wellness while educating the community regarding cultural influence and appropriate interactions. They have had a huge impact on our community to date, and we all look forward to their continued leadership in the future. So congratulations up from Slavery, Slavery Initiative. Daryl, I see you're here. So would you like to say a few words? Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Kristen. Um, thank you, Dion. Thank you to the council, uh, Marlena. I see so many faces on here. Uh, just warms my heart um, that we, we, we've been acknowledged in this manner. Sorry, sorry, we didn't get the message a little earlier, but it doesn't take away from the honor um, that we're experiencing at this time. Um, I'd like to say uh, thank you to you all as, as citizens for, for, for the most part. Um, I think this is, a, this is a different space for people of color. Um, over the last several years, this is the first time people have asked or been concerned about our basic rights, if you will, uh, and, and to be intentionally serious. Um, so we're, we're, we're appreciative of that. I will say, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know how up slavery initially got started, uh, of course it was the uh, uprisings and all of that stuff. Uh, and we had seen those movies before and we already knew how they end. Uh, so when we got to talking, uh, we decided that whatever approach we, we would take, it wouldn't be from a space of victimization. Uh, we are not victims in our mind because the, the, the title of From Slavery came from a book by Booker T. Washington. Uh, and, and what we realized, Marlena just spoke about emancipation in 19, 1863, but by 1920, less than 50 years later, 
they had Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, with driving businesses, banks, and all of that. Um, so we felt uh, as business leaders and community leaders that uh, in less than 50 years, we could plant enough seeds that will grow exponentially. And, uh, you know, we don't, everything is in our control to, 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 to deal with and to handle to make life better for us and the people around us. Um, and financial literacy was key. Um, you can ask any person of color, 70% um, of our problems have to do with not being able to make a dollar and what to do with it when you get, to, when you get it. Um, so that's that's our approach. Uh, we just want to thank you for honoring and recognizing us. And uh, I'm glad to see some of you all who were at the conference. Uh, I still hear people talking about it. And I just want to tell you to stay tuned for the next conference that I think it's I think the date is May 24th. Um, and we'll we'll be getting more information out about that right after the first of the year. So thank you all very much. And I appreciate you. Thank you, Daryl. Fantastic. I'm going to pass the mic to Dion, and she is going to speak about the Lifetime Award. Good morning, everyone. This year, we had several nominations for the Lifetime Achievement Award, and we had a tie between two of those who were nominated. Lily Kodama is unable to be here with us today, but she uh, expressed her gratitude for being acknowledged. Like many of our award recipients, Lily was um, wanting us to focus on the work that's being done in the community and all of those who are doing this work in, in Kitsap County. Lily is an elder who is Nisei. She was born in 1935 in Bainbridge Island, Washington as Lily Kitamoto Kodama is her married name. She was seven years old and in the second grade when she and her family were evacuated to a concentration camp in California. They were later transferred to a different camp in Idaho and eventually turned to returned to Bainbridge with her family. She's the oldest of four children. Her father worked in Seattle and Felix Narte and Ilalio Aquino, two Filipino men who had helped her grandparents, stayed on the family farm and ran the Kitamoto home while they were away and interred during World War II. Lily does her work the gentle way. She tells her story. And she's committed to keeping those wartime human rights stories alive for generations of adult school children who make the journey across the pond, as Lily says. As a member of the Bainbridge Island Japanese American Community Group, she continues to work with others to ensure that what happened to her family does not happen again. She shares her memories of growing up on a farm at the head of Fletcher Bay, including her grandparents and parents' journey to the island, life on the farm, and her mother's work managing the farm and after World War II while her father worked in Seattle. She talks about their experiences being interred during the war and their close relationship with the Filipino immigrants who kept the farm running while they were gone. She plays an important leadership role in our community, keeping those stories alive. And her brother, Frank, also played an important role bringing attention to the forced exclusion experience and in the establishing of the Japanese American Exclusion Memorial in Eagle Dale. So I just want to extend immense gratitude to Lily for her right, human rights work in our community. Thank you, Lily. Second is Mary Gleistein. Mary is also unable to be here with us today. She has devoted her entire life to human rights and is always at the front line, bringing attention to the rights and issues that impact people in our communities. Mary's frequently present at demonstrations throughout the county, raising awareness and rallying others to raise their voices to protect human rights. She is always at the forefront to take action, inspire others to action and actively seek solutions, whether it's with a group of neighbors or meeting with legislators and commissioners. She does her human rights work a different way. And we want to acknowledge both of these methods of doing human rights work because they both have value. She's well known for her work as a peace activist protesting against nuclear weapons. She's a founding member of Kingston Cares and um, frequently volunteers at the quarantine at the cold weather shelter and also volunteered at the quarantine center and isolation, uh, isolation centers during the pandemic. In the last year, in addition to everything else that Mary does, she's been working with local youth who reported incidents of racist acts in local schools, encouraging young people to organize, raise their voices, and engage with leadership to demand action. 
She's a longtime member of the Kingston Community Advisory Council and a volunteer with Stillwater's Environmental Center, which protects the Puget Sound and life within and along its shores. She raises awareness about the deforestation of land in Kitsap and draws regional and national attention to issues that impact our area. She's also frequently writing letters to editors, testifying at public hearings in Kitsap and Olympia, and serves as a mentor to young activists. Most recently, she testified in support of a promised or proposed ordinance that would ban the sale of firearms at the Kitsap County Fairgrounds. Her other passion is books, and as a member of the Friends of the Kingston Library, she helps raise funds to support summer reading programs for children. So Mary, thank you for the immense work that you have done over your lifetime in Kitsap County, and we look forward to seeing what you do in the years that are ahead. And I will hand it off now for our transition into our panel discussion. Thank you, Dion, and thank you to all our award winners, the model that you give us um, in this community for human rights work. Before we get to the panel, however, I'm going to pass it back to, El to Elizabeth Holmes, our tech uh, guru for the day, to give us a, a sort of a tech intro for our time together. Today. Hi, everybody. I'm actually going to share a screen. Um, so these are the little like Zoom instructions. Since we've been in the pandemic for almost three years at this point, there are many of you who are probably super familiar with Zoom, um, but I have these little instructions just in case, um, and they're going to be posted in the chat periodically, just in case some folks like show up a little bit later to go to sessions that they were interested in. Um, so there will be instruction slides throughout the uh, conference today that sort of guide us as to how to join the workshop sessions that we're most interested in at the different time blocks. Um, please stay muted unless you're asked to unmute yourself. Um, as a co-host for the conference, I will probably be asking some folks to unmute periodically and also muting folks who might forget. Um, so try not to be surprised by that. It is not haunted, it's me. Um, with terminology, the the main meeting, like the meeting you're in, is the big conference, um, and then the breakout rooms are the workout set uh, workshop sessions. Whoops, <laughs> the breakout sessions. Um, if you leave the conference at any time, um, either accidentally or intentionally, you can always rejoin via the link from your registration. Um, please be on time to sessions. So you'll be able to join your own, but do not join halfway through or midway through or switch sessions in the middle. It can be really disruptive for the flow of um, the, the presentations that folks are giving. Um, so we'll be in like the main lobby, effectively speaking, when you come back in, if you do leave um, accidentally or intentionally, and we can just, you know, vibe while we wait for the next sessions to start. Um, there will be two recorded things, um, the Linda Gabriel Awards that we just completed and the roundtable session that we are just about to get into. Um, other than that, nothing else will be recorded. Um, and after the conference, as soon as you close the Zoom meeting, um, you'll get like a little, an additional window that'll pop up that'll have survey questions about your experience with the conference. Please fill those out. Um, it gives us pretty good feedback as to like how we're going to be doing conferences in the future, what y'all would like to see, that sort of thing. Um, and again, I'll be popping this stuff in the chat uh, periodically, just in case we need a little bit of a refresher, uh, particularly about the survey and how to join and leave um, workshop sessions. Thank you so much for coming today, and I will pass it back to Susie. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, our, I have been the chair of the conference planning team this year and the conversations we had throughout the year, uh, we were looking, we always look for something that is, what are the pressing needs in our communities? And we were looking at the, the homelessness and housing crisis, the body autonomy crises going on as people are feeling threatened uh, by recent legislation at the federal level and what's going on in our climate uh, with our planet. And so we, we developed this theme, this is home. Our bodies, 
our plant, our, our communities, our planet. And we, we spent a lot of time thinking about what is home. And home uh, is where we feel safe. Home is where we feel safe and known. And it's the place we come back to for nourishment and restoration. And so our bodies and our communities and our planet are all spaces we call home. And also where human rights violations often occur is on, on bodies and in communities and on our planet. And these are all, these three spaces are really deeply connected, aren't they? So advocating for and restoring health to bodies and to communities and to our planet and to the earth, that helps move healing and human rights forward. And, and so today we have a really beautiful um, opportunity to hear from people who do work in these areas of body autonomy or have experience in, in leadership in these spaces of body autonomy, housing and homelessness and community, and also climate uh, care. And so we have a roundtable conversation uh, that we want to, uh, that we're going to have today. And our moderator of this um, uh, morning's Roundtable is Marwan Cameron. And Marwan is just uh, one of my favorite people in Kitsap. He's been, in, he gets, he's in so many different spaces. And I'll let me read just a little bit about Marwan. He is the founder and executive director of Gather Together, Grow Together, or G2, which is a nonprofit um, that provides food and transportation for people in need. Like they have vans running all over town, getting uh, people to appointments and to various um, spaces that they need to, or job interviews, people who might not otherwise have easy um, access to transportation. Marwan is also a consultant for the Navy's Fleet and Family Support Center, and he's an educational advisor for Navy College, and he has taught as an adjunct faculty in a myriad of disciplines, primarily business management at Olympic College. Marwan is a former Bremerton Housing Authority Commissioner and currently serves on the board of directors for Kitsap Regional Library, as well as the Resilient Ecosystems Board. In between his work and his volunteer service, Marwan keeps busy connecting people across Kitsap through his Conduit video podcast. If you haven't checked that out, Google that um, on YouTube. You can you can catch up on previous videos, and you can also um, he always has these live videos of popping into important um, regional meetings. Marwan's mission and the mission of G two is to ensure that every Kitsap resident has support and access to the resources they need. He has always been passionate about improving the lives of his Kitsap neighbors and is always striving to find ways to increase access to education and resources for his community. And Marwan just always makes you feel welcome and connected and heard. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Marwan and hand off to him our roundtable conversation today. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Pastor Beal. That was very, uh, <laughs> very kind words there. Uh, one correction, I'm not currently consulting uh, for the Navy. Uh, that's something that I did in my past and for the Navy College office, but uh, two, two things I was honored to do. Uh, we're going to get into our discussion today. And as uh, Susie was saying, you know, the theme is this is home. Our bodies, our communities, our planet. Now, many of you may know that, you know, recently, Kitsap Community Resources, the United Way, uh, Kitsap Public Health, and several others have re recently launched a community needs assessment throughout Kitsap County. Uh, and this has garnered uh, the highest response uh, that it has ever had. And I believe that it's important to kind of put those things together as we have this discussion. And in that, three of the top concerns have come forward uh, in those responses. And one was healthcare, two was transportation, and three was affordable housing and homelessness. 
And in that, I was going to, you know, read a few of the comments. I, I was given access to the data early, uh, and everyone will have access to this data come around February, uh, and it will appear on the Kitsap Public Health Portal and also on the KCR Portal, uh, portal uh, for everyone to access. But one of the main things, um, the through line, if you will, was the fact that people weren't qualifying for services and resources. And I think that's really important. And it really just gets to the crux of, of this year's theme. So I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, I'm going to introduce our panel today. Uh, and we have uh, four people with us, I believe. I think the names have changed. So please forgive me if I get some wrong. Uh, but we have uh, Dion Deshaun, we have Madison Rozak, Elizabeth Holmes, and we also have our last person. Is it Scott Willard? No. Who is our Who is our fourth there? John Doherty. John Doherty. And we also have Stormy Purser. Stormy Purser. All right. We have a fifth person. Yeah, we have five people on the today's panel. All right. So. I would like to welcome all of them to our discussion. Now, this is going to be different. This isn't going to be a panel. This is going to be a conversation for the next hour. So welcome to all of you. If you'll unmute yourself, because we're going to have a discussion. So I don't want you to mute your mics. Uh, it's okay if we talk over a little bit. Uh, that, that's all right. That's what this is. Okay. So what I'll do is I will call you uh, and just kind of guide it a little bit. But it will start with Dion, and then we'll just go next. So Dion, tell us a little bit about yourself, your organization that you work with. Um, I am in the Indianola area of Kitsap County. I've been in and out of Kitsap since 1992. I have family members who are in the Navy. So like many, that's how I initially came here. And I work with several different organizations. I chair the Council for Human Rights. I am a... Uh, an analyst, strategist, technical writer, and mediator. I do policy and grant work for the Port Gamble Sklalem Tribe. I am on the faculty at Northwest Indian College, teaching primarily English. And I chaired this council, then going into my third year with the council. Um, and I do mediation work with the Washington State Bar Association and Washington Mediation Association, sit on Olympic College's Workforce Development Advisory Council and the Washington State Human Trafficking Task Force. And I'm really honored this year to have been selected for the International City County Management Association's Leadership Institute on Race, Equity, and Inclusion, which selects about 20 people from around the nation every year. And um, everybody else is a city attorney or city manager or mayor or something like that. So I'm really honored to be included in that group. Oh, that is awesome, Dion. Thank you for that. Madison. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Madison Rozak. Uh, I'm the operations coordinator for Kids Up Homes of Compassion. Uh, I'm also an MSW student with Boston University. Uh, I've done equity work in health, education, and housing in jobs and volunteers position. I was in AmeriCorps VISTA. Um, I found my calling to work in housing because I believe it's an essential step in a person reaching their full potential or um, the self-actualization stage, if you like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, Kids Up Homes and Compassion provides housing and access to support services to people previously experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. We create a master lease with landlords and sublet rooms to folks. Um, we currently have 26 shared living spaces across Kids Up County. Um, and if anyone's interested in accessing our, our services, uh, you go through KCR's uh, Housing Solutions Center. Oh, thank you for that. <clears throat> John, how are you today? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, good morning. It's it's good to be here. Uh yeah, I'm I'm let's just say I'm doing fine, okay? Um, I always have an asterisk on how I'm feeling, depends on what the topic is specifically. I'm an activist with Citizens Climate Lobby. I do live down in Tacoma, but there's lots of CCL, Citizens Climate Lobby activists up in uh, Kitsap County. Uh, including uh, Marty Bishop, who is the one that invited me in here. Uh, so thankful to her for that. I'm also uh, associated with radio station KTAH down here in Tacoma. I have a, a weekly climate talk program where we talk about everything climate and also have a, a program Climate Minute that uh, is broadcast here in Tacoma and also up on Vashon Island 
Um, so I share a passion with folks, like-minded folks about the impact of climate change, uh, the inequities of the impact of climate change. And that's one of the focuses of my work. And I think that's one of the things I'm gonna be talking about today. Awesome, thank you for that. And let's go on over to Stormy. Stormy isn't here yet. I am keeping okay. an eye on it because we started a little early. I am keeping an eye on the chat to pop Stormy up um, when, when she arrives. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is that the same with Scott also? There's no Scott. Oh, who's our fifth person? Me. Stormy. <laughs> Elizabeth Holmes. <laughs> well, Miss Elizabeth, will you please? Go ahead and share a little bit about yourself. You are doing double duty today. <laughs> Multitasking. Um, my name is Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, I use she, her, and they, them pronouns. I work for a local community behavioral health agency in Kitsap County, but I'm not necessarily here uh, representing them today, although they do a lot. Uh, they're doing a lot of work for um, gender-related health care. Um, so I'm a licensed mental health counselor in Washington State. I did a lot of my schooling and growing up in rural Florida, though. <laughs> um, so I live here now. Um, and uh, the the way in which I conceptualize kind of like home and the theme of the conference is like feeling at home in one's body, right? And how gender affirming healthcare and like even at a basic level, gender affirming language um, and working with gender diverse folks, so trans folks, non-binary folks. Um, how how do we as a society like affirm as many folks as we can right and like by being gender affirming we become more open people more better people and more compassionate people um so um like i guess my whole focus in behavioral health is like the empowerment of gender diverse folks um because like you need to be a licensed mental health professional to help gender diverse folks access the surgical care that they want, need, and deserve. Um, and depending on the state you live in, um, this care is more or less accessible. Um, in Washington state, it is more accessible than where I grew up in Florida, where it is not as accessible. Um, and every time I talk about gender diversity or do a little talk about like what gender affirming language is, something new has happened to negatively impact gender diverse people. Um, which is devastating. And it usually impacts gender diverse youth first. So as we all might know, um, there are a lot of initiatives in a lot of different states to prohibit uh, trans youth and gender diverse youth from accessing any type of gender affirming care, which depending on the state you live in can be something as simple as going by the names and pronouns that you use in the classroom that is considered gender affirming care and is illegal <laughs> um, for youth. Um, and so part of what I do and why I'm invested in this work is like advocating for trans rights while also trying to help them help support them through their gender journey in accessing um, the care that they need, want and deserve. Um, and that's a little about me. Ah, thank you for that, Elizabeth. We appreciate it. So what we'll do is we're going to jump right into our questions. Take your time, panel, and you are open, please, if you have a question or a comment. Uh, as we're asking the questions and we're going through it, go ahead and just jump on in. And I'm going to start with Madison. And, you know, data, as I shared in the very beginning, is very important and it helps to guide our work. But stories are critical. Uh, tell us a short story about how the work that you do furthers human rights and how you've helped to cultivate home uh, for people. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um... So housing uh, was declared a housing re uh, human right in like the 1940s, I believe. Um, and so I work a lot with uh, the infrastructure of our program in creating sustainability. Um, I also have a role as a house manager uh, for one of our homes where um, I come in uh, either weekly or monthly um, and meet with uh, the folks in a home uh, to help promote uh, independent living in the shared living environment and self-governance. Um, and uh, we recently need to fill one of the rooms in the house that I'm a house manager for. And I got to sit down with the women and talk to them about like what they want in a roommate. And I think that 
having the client voice in these conversations when we want to bring in a new person um, to just inform our work in general is really important. Um, we can't create homes without the input of the people who are living in the homes. Um, the whole point is to have a shared living community and um, there's some compatibility issues or not issues, but compatibility that needs to be taken into account. So I, I love my work doing the background, uh, you know, expanding our services and doing the housing first work, but I also find a lot of value in working uh, with the clients directly to hear what they need and help that inform what I'm building. So I hope that answers your question. Now that, that's an excellent story there. Anyone have a comment or a question for Madison? I know I do. I so, love housing first as yeah. like, just from a comment perspective, I love the housing first model. I think that like you seeking stability has to start with a place where you are actually able to be stable and like feel like it's yours. Um, and so uh, I think that's incredibly valuable. Um, and I guess I would wonder um, when it comes to, when it comes to gender diverse clients, are things like that taken into account, particularly when it comes to shared living environments and how to like maintain safety for gender diverse folks, that sort of thing? Yeah, um, we have sort of, we have women's homes, we have men's homes, and we have mixed homes. Um, when it comes to gender diversity, um, we kind of allow client choice in where they would feel most comfortable. Um, that's what we've, we've done in the past and it's worked out well. You know, uh, Madison, our bodies, our communities, right? This is this is the communities piece of it. What are some of the tenets um, of Homes for Compassion? As far as what what do the folks that are living there get? As far as you know, being in that community, because that that's important. I think sometimes we have an absence of that in a, in our society right now. Yeah, um, well, I don't want to spoil too much for our presentation, um, but uh, one of the things that happens with folks experiencing homelessness is there's like an extreme sense of isolation, right? And that can be perpetuated with single homes when you live by yourself. So when we bring people into these shared living communities, they get that social connectedness that we all really need. Um, there's some research that like, a lack of social connectedness um, is worse for your body than like smoking or something like that. Like isolation that's that's perpetuated um, after experiencing homelessness in these individual homes is dangerous, quite frankly. Um, so I think that that's one of the main things that people get is that social connectedness and um, that helps people feel supported and are able to thrive and not just survive, um, which they may have been um, used to doing for so long. So people get uh, better uh, opportunities for like uh, getting an education, getting jobs, getting financial security, things like that when they have the support of a community. Absolutely. Dion, let me come to you. Uh, tell us a short story about how your work furthers human rights and how you've helped to cultivate home for people. Yeah, so here on the Council for Human Rights, we work to address um, situations in the community that are uh, disenfranchising, uh, making people unable to safely participate in community or live here and feel like they have an equal voice. So I would say locally, that's the most important. Um, I tend to do a lot of work on bioethics type issues um, where bodily autonomy is being infringed upon. And I, I tend to think of the body as the first place that we need to feel safe and at home and working with human trafficking victims and um, children who've been abused, you come to realize the value of that that autonomy, that safety within one's own body being the first layer. And then the home, like Madison's talking about, being the next layer. And then within the community, those around us uh, being a safe place where we can be ourselves and talk and have differences of religion or political opinion being the next layer. And then, of course, living on a planet where we have a recognition of shared interests being the next layer. 
And so I, I feel like I, I tend over the course of my lifetime to focus more or less on one area. But um, all of these, I, I, I think I've always seen the interconnection between them um, and how the compromising of any one of them affects all of them and preserving all of them is important. So right now I do a lot of work with uh, Sustainable Communities Advisory Council at the national level and helped get a building code passed for sustainable building methods that are low cost, non-toxic with the Cobb Research Institute. And um, tend to get pulled into these conversations about how individual freedoms are being infringed upon and what we as a community need to reform in terms of policy or uh, rules at city levels, things like that, that affect the institutionalize those inequities and injustices. Do you find that people are receptive or do they have previous knowledge or is this a new concept uh, when you're having this, this dialogue with folks? You know, Marwan, it's across the board. I mean, it's, there's such a range. I think the what I'm finding right now, so I sit on the International City County Management Sustainable Communities Advisory Council, but also chair the equity uh, committee there. And I'm finding that there are so many really well-intended people in positions of either appointed, elected, or hired uh, leadership at city, county, and state levels who want to do equity work. And they, it's so amorphous. It's so big and it's difficult to just get a grasp on, especially when we're dealing with preconceived notions, um, you know, institutional biases, um, the things that we've been raised with that we haven't dealt with internally yet. So how are we going to help resolve it externally within our organizations or governments? So I think that's the hardest thing right now is helping those in positions of power who are working on those things to figure out how to do the work where to grab on and start untangling the mess that we have to untangle. I appreciate that. Any and I wanted thoughts? to point out that Stormy has joined us. She is here. <laughs> here How are you doing, Stormy? Stormy? <laughs> so since Stormy is here, Stormy, we'll, we'll, we'll stop for a second and have you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the organization uh, that you work with. Okay, um, so my name is Stormy Purser. Um, I'm a member of the Port Gamble Sklalem tribe. Um, I'm actually uh, currently a stay at home mom. I resigned my position um, with the tribe last year. I was the um, tribal historic preservation officer. Um, so I've been kind of doing the stay at home mom thing uh, for the last year. My kids are both um, five and under, so that's really important years to, to be with them. Um, but I still continue to um, kind of work with my tribe and um, do things like this. I'm uh, really honored to be invited uh, to sit on this panel. Um, and uh, yeah, I still, I'm an advocate um, for my tribe, I guess, whenever somebody asks me to, to be kind of a voice for my people, I try to do my best and get out there, but um, yeah, that's me. Was there anything specifically you wanted to know, or? Oh no, no, just a just a quick introduction, and and we're kind of into our questions now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over to Elizabeth and restate the question, and I'm gonna come to you after John. And so okay. our question, uh, just to restate it again, Elizabeth, tell us a short story about how your work furthers human rights and how you've helped to cultivate homes for people. It's a really good question. And there are a lot of ways in which, um, like working directly with um, gender diverse clients in the work that I do, um, can help with that cultivation of the sense of home, right? Because it reinforces that bodily autonomy. Um, because behavioral health professionals do function um, in different states as gatekeepers as to whether or not gender diverse folks are allowed to access their type of care um, and the types of care that they need. Because um, usually it's insurances that have these guidelines because globally there's the WPATH standards of care. The world 
Professional Association for Transgender Health. They outline the standards of care as to like how generally some guidelines might be beneficial to advocate for um, the health needs of gender diverse folks. Um, and then insurance companies and different states uh, make decisions as to about what the actual requirements are in their local government um, for gender diverse folks to be able to access gender affirming surgeries, such as mastectomies, hysterectomies, orchiectomies, which is like removal of the testicles, um, vaginoplasties, phalloplasties, et cetera. And they all have different requirements. <laughs> uh, for some, you need to be on hormones for a certain amount of time for some of the surgeries, depending on the state you live in. Um, and sometimes you need one behavioral health professional letter and a letter from your primary care doctor, or you need two behavioral health professional letters and a letter from your primary care doctor, <laughs> um, which is a lot of hoops to jump through. And so um, with all this in mind, like technically I am a behavioral health professional, like as that role, I'm a barrier to their care. Um, and so when working with clients, what we do then is we talk about like, here are the barriers that likely you have faced. Tell me about your journey with your gender. Let's talk about this and let's use this letter. That's a requirement, um, to advocate for you. This is your document. Let's use it as an advocacy tool to make sure that whoever needs this letter understands what your needs are and why this care is necessary. Um, for you to make you feel more at home in yourself, in your social relationships, um, to mitigate whatever type of gender dysphoria a person experiences. So that's like that gender dysphoria as it exists is like the way in which you feel incongruent in the society that does not accept you and the ways you might feel incongruent in your body. So make your body more like home and make it easier for you to experience that sense of home socially. Um, and so it's it's a really long-winded answer, but like home is a very complicated things for a complicated thing for like LGBTQ people generally. Um, because you can have people that are very affirming for you. It can be your family, it might not be, and in some cases it definitely isn't. Um, like gender diverse youth are more likely to end up without housing or unhoused um, than their cisgender peers. Um, that's true for adults uh, as well. Gender diverse adults are also more likely to end up without jobs based on discrimination and like they tend to qualify um, for, uh, Medicaid insurance, which is something, um, which is one of the things the agency where I work takes. Uh, one of the good things about Medicaid in Washington, though, is that it pays for gender affirming, uh, medical interventions, which is great. <laughs> um, and it's not the case everywhere. So, um, it's, it's towing that fine line of like, what does home look like for the client that I'm working with? Um, what does that mean both internally, like home in the self, and home in the community, what does that mean? Um, how am I going to be as safe as possible if I present this way, this way, and this way? Um, so it's a multifaceted experience. Um, and one of the reasons that I have a complicated relationship with the work that I do, I want to be able to advocate for people. And I also understand that by the fact of having to write this letter, it's just another thing that they have to do to do the thing <laughs> that they need, right? So, yeah, if that answers the question. Absolutely, absolutely. A lot of head nod uh, there. Um, Want to let everyone know that there will be a Q&A after. There are a few hands that shot up, so folks are definitely super engaged, which is, which is great. John, you look like you wanted to say something. Did you have a question or a comment? No, I'm just standing by for my turn. All right, all right. So. My question uh, for you, Elizabeth, is, I guess it's first a, uh, a comment, then a question. You know, there is a, a, a lot of noise that is out in the news and the social media. Are there um, some, you know, active campaigns to try to counteract that? Because I don't see much of that out there um, in regards to being supportive and dispelling the, the myths and some sometimes just outright lies. Uh, so is does that exist? And, you know, how do people access, you know, those things? It 
does exist in a lot of grassroots ways. You also have mm. different professional organizations that advocate for the benefits of gender diverse folks. So like the professional organization that I'm a part of, um, the American Counseling Association makes statements advocating for like um, the care for gender diverse youth, because that's what's currently one of the biggest things um, that's negatively impacted. Uh, one, one of the giant bummers is is that you'll have medical professionals um, and institutions that provide gender affirming care for gender diverse youth, often in the form of like puberty blockers, hormone therapy, um, literally just interventions about like with a therapist talking about their gender journey, what they want that to be like. Um, those institutions then get a lot of like protests and a lot of um, negative press. And I think that when it comes to negative press, that is a lot more common than the positive press about what folks do to address these concerns. Um, so a lot of what's done to address them is like Washington State, for example, said that they would provide um, both reproductive health care for uh, folks who live in states where reproductive health care was not accessible, but also gender diverse health care for those uh, in states where they do not have access to those things. Um, one of the barriers to that can be, though, is like, for example, um, like a couple of years ago, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois didn't cover any cosmetic surgery, which gender diverse surgeries were determined to meet under Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois, which is not managed by the same Blue Cross Blue Shield that manages Primera here. Because insurance is so complicated and so gatekeepy, if someone came here from Illinois to get gender affirming care, they wouldn't be able to access that through their insurance and would have to pay for it out of pocket. Um, and I know that's kind of around the question. There are a lot of things that individuals do, like behavioral health professionals make treatises. And um, there was an LMFT, I think, in the Pierce Kitsap. King County area who was um, performing uh, conversion therapy, which by every behavioral health organization is um, is not beneficial, actively harmful, and encourages harm to the youth and adults that experience conversion therapy. D tell us, let me jump in here. Tell us what an LMFT is. A licensed marriage and family therapist. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so a licensed mental health counselor is an LMHC. LICSW is licensed independent clinical social worker and LMFT is licensed in marriage, licensed marriage and family therapist. There are a lot of acronyms in mental health and I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, but a licensed marriage and family therapist was performing conversion therapy and um, which is illegal in the state against youth, by the way, it's illegal in Washington to perform conversion therapy against youth. Um, and he sued <laughs> um, and lost. And there were a lot of, um, he lost his suit and there were a lot of uh, amicus briefs and other individuals and organizations that were like, conversion therapy is actively harmful. Here's all the research. Here's why we don't do it. And here's why it's illegal in Washington. Um, so there's a lot of behind the scenes movement of professional organizations and individuals who work to advocate for this type of care. Um, and uh just working with, the short answer is negative press is a lot easier to sell. And there was an op-ed in the New York Times like two or three weeks ago about like what, what gender affirming care is a good thing, but is it really was like the tone of the article for like youth. And it was incredibly, it wasn't done by a researcher and it wasn't done in a meaningful way. It was done in that way where it like okay. advocates for that fear mongering of gender diversity. Um, so I'm actually doing a little gender affirming care language 101 at 1245 um, that talks about the stats, the actual numbers of how this can be beneficial. What does that look like? How common is detransition really? It's not. It's like less than 1% of anybody who engages in gender affirming like stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole nuanced issue, but it gets well, a lot of let attention. Me, let me jump in there because we don't want you to give away the I whole, the whole I just workshop. Get really excited. But this, I know it's going to be fantastic. So do go to that workshop. It's going to be some some hard choices, folks. Uh, but yeah, that that is uh, thank you for that answer, because I 
I do see that a lot. And I just wanted to know, like, what what's the counter narrative to that? And where does that exist? But let's go on over to John. Uh, John, tell us a short story about how your work furthers human rights and how you've helped to cultivate home for people. Yeah, so I'm going to start off by making the story about me a little bit and then expand out from there uh, how this uh, can be applied more generally and to uh, a larger circle. So one of the joys in my radio program, I do interviews. In the last couple of years, I've interviewed over 50 people uh, on uh, topics related to climate change, which is, of course, is a huge topic. Mm -hmm. So you would think, well, we could cover climate change in two or three episodes, not so. And in talking to people, I've talked to people all over the political and ideological spectrum too. And so the one of my one of my key focuses is I think about climate change and I think about everything else that we're talking about here today, the necessity of being clear-eyed in our approach. It's so easy to slip into an ideological mode all anywhere on the political spectrum. And sometimes, maybe even often, those ideological views can inter interfere with us accomplishing what it is we actually want to accomplish because we are not saying things in a clear-eyed way. So that was an impact on me from talking to all these various experts from all over the mm -hmm. spectrum with all the different areas that I noticed that my own worldview was changing and listening to these people and in changing in a better way. It was changing to be more understanding of people who think or see things differently than I do. Uh, that, that, I, that my own worldview could evolve as I learned more and more about the world. So I think that, that while uh, in talking about climate change, that's been critically important. I think that also, is true no matter what uh, lights our fire, what our passion is, where we're working, uh, that we take the trouble, the time to listen to other people and, and, and including people, I've listened to people that I, I guess I would say I strongly have disagreed with, but if I can't understand what it is they're trying to say, how can I expect them to understand what it is that I'm trying to say? So, so just to sum up my story, my own personal journey through talking to all these experts has shown me the way to uh, being willing to open myself up to ideas at first that might seem strange. And then after a while, see, I can see, man, I, I can now see the world more clearly than I could before. And I benefit from that. And everybody that I work with benefits from that, too. All right, Dion, you are definitely nodding your head quite a bit there. Thoughts on, <laughs> on climate change and what John was saying there. I think equity and climate change are sort of, if you pull on either one of those strings, it leads to everything else. And um, I was acknowledging, John, when you were saying, if I can't understand what the other person's saying, how can I expect them to understand what I'm saying? And the other thing is, if I can understand what they're saying, I don't even know what to respond to. So I think it's valuable to approach it from a place of curiosity and asking questions to try to understand what others are saying. Yeah, well put. And I think that there's a, a myth in our culture that understanding equates to agreeing with. And so therefore, people are reluctant to understand. And um, I've seen over and over again the whole flavor of a conversation changing when the other person gets that, oh, A, this guy cares enough to understand what I just have to say, and I can mm -hmm. see that mm -hmm. he pretty much does understand what I have to say. Now we have a basis for some kind of conversation, whereas if it's just like I say, they say, then we're, we're stuck in an endless loop that's not going to get either one of us to where we want to be. Can I throw something in there, Marwan? Yeah, yes, please. So I think that you're hitting on a crucial point here. And I think that even when we have diametrically opposed positions, if we can respectfully talk with one another, we still find that we have a common ground in the middle. It's just that we have different values or different uh, immediate needs that lead us to take a different approach to that situation. So I think the reason I was asked to sit on the panel today was because of the bodily 
autonomy aspect and abortion because it's a, it's such a difficult piece to represent in the community. And um, we'll get into that, I suspect, but I'm very much pro-choice, but I'm also anti-abortion. And that's such a hard thing for people to understand. I don't believe that we can morally legislate what a person does with their body. And um, I think that is one of those issues where it's so divisive and it has been for gosh, 70, 80 years and certainly over the last 50 years. But when we stop and talk about it and about what our hope is for those children, I frequently find that we actually have shared positions and interests. It's just that I'm not willing to restrict another person in terms of their choices about what they do with their body. So um, I think you're hitting on a key point about seeking that understanding, finding that common ground and understanding why we each arrive at different uh, positions on policy or recommendations, despite having that shared ground. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And I would, I'll, I'll just tag on one other quick thing here that, that surprisingly, sometimes when I do take the time to listen, I learned something that I didn't know before. And I was like, that that's, I'm, I'm a better person, better able to face the world because I know this. And the only reason I know it is because I was willing to listen to this person who initially I might've thought, uh, they're, they're, they don't have it quite right. Well, John, you and I, I think are the only two gray haired people on the panel right now. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I find that 10 years ago, the positions I held on things are not the positions I hold now. And that has happened every decade right. of my life. Yep. So being less attached to what I currently think and accepting that I'm going to keep learning and growing and my positions are going to change. So don't get so dogmatic about it that I alienate people or stop growing in the process. Yeah. Okay. And I'll just toss out that I, at first I'm like, Hey, wait a minute. How does she know I have gray hair? I says, Oh yeah, my mustache. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, circling back to something Madison said earlier about Maslow's hierarchy and that, that basic need you know, safety uh, is a big one, right? And what kind of got me um, interested in climate change was learning about, you know, Cascadia rising and, and what can happen here if this big earthquake happens and, you know, looking at, you know, the fact is there an emergency plan uh, for folks and how are we going to take care of each other? And uh, that that's a critical piece. And quite frankly, it terrifies me. Uh, so, you know, definitely having these conversations and planning and being proactive I think is really important. So I definitely appreciate this discussion. But let's zoom on over to, to Stormy. Stormy, tell us a short story about how your work furthers human rights and how you've helped to cultivate home for people. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna just go off of my previous position um, with the tribe. Um, so as I said, I was the historic preservation officer. Um, and in that position, it really taught me a lot about my people, um, you know, our not only our history, but kind of the history of this place and, um, you know, the events that, that took place. Um, oh, I'm so sorry, you guys. I have my kids home with me today, so they're... <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um, can I... I'm sorry. I'm going to have to check on this one second. All right. So while Stormy is doing that, we'll move on in our in our questions. And Elizabeth, I'm going to come to you first. What does it mean to feel safe? Body, community, and planet. Now, I'm going to kind of combine these two questions together, because what is the intersection between the three spaces of body, community, and planet? Can you unpack that for us? A little bit. I can probably unpack it a little bit. That's that's a tall order. Um, <laughs> I guess for me, it's like um, you've got the wider community, right? Like the big community that we are all effectively speaking a part of. And then you've got the smaller communities and then the intersections of different communities. So like um, acknowledging that like gender diverse people of color have different experiences than white gender diverse people and sort of knowing that like the queer community at large has its own groups inside that smaller community. And so I think safety in the body goes about like bodily autonomy. What am I able to do with my body? Can And that can range from anything to like, I eat what I want. Um, I get tattoos when I want um, and have funds. And 
Um, I do these, but also I'm able to meet the needs of my body right? So like I have access to food. I have access to medical care. I have access to care that I might need in a gender diverse body that someone who is not gender diverse might need. Um, the language, um, the medical community, having language that is more um, encompassing of gender diversity and understanding how these things might present different types of medical complications and also understanding that gender diversity is not necessarily why someone seeks medical care and holding the balance for these things. So it's like, how does my community interact with other communities and am I safe to talk about my participation in a community if I were, um, if I were like needing different types of care? Um, and from like, from a planetary perspective, I mean, that's where the bigger community comes in, right? But I can't necessarily, um, if I were a more vulnerable, like a, a more systemically vulnerable person, right? If I had a lot more intersections of my ability to, um, access the things that I need, how can I focus on the really big picture if I am not safe right now? So it kind of goes into Madison's work, um, with housing first. How can I focus on my mental health if I do not have a place to live, <laughs> right? Because one of the bummers about being an MSW or a licensed mental health professional or what have you is that you can't therapy people a house. Um, you can't therapy people their medical care all of the time. You can't therapy people stuff. So how do we cultivate that individual sense of safety in the body and the community to give folks the opportunity to advocate for the bigger things that they definitely care about. Like there are vulnerable folks who are like, climate change and the way the planet is going really sucks. I don't have time to do things about it because I'm trying to meet my basic needs on the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. I would like to be able to help my communities. I would like to be able to organize mutual aid for if when a climate disaster happens right? I want to be able to have mutual aid organizations, but I can't do any of that because I can't even get individual aid going on. Um, Elizabeth, let me jump in there. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. But you touched on both climate and housing. So I'm going to throw it over to Madison for that. So, you know, and I, and I love the fact that you said I can't, I can't therapy, you know, housing, however you put it was, was, I've never heard it like that. That was great. Um, so, you know, Madison, you know, tell us, what does it mean to feel safe, body, community, and planet? And what is the intersection, as Elizabeth kind of made some of that connective tissue there, um, you know, in, in between body, community, and planet? Yeah, um, I love this line of thought question. Um, excuse me. I kind of see the intersection, I'm going to start with the intersection um, and then circle back to housing. Um, I kind of see the intersection uh, with health. Um, and like healthy looks different for every person. So it's not a monolith. So just keep that in mind when I'm talking about health. Um, we need a strong body community and planet um, to see better health and better health outcomes. Um, unfortunately, in the US, we face a lot of inequalities due to the structural oppressions embedded in our social systems that manifest in the social determinants of health. Um, we as a people cannot thrive unless these health inequities are tackled. Um, and I say inequity instead of inequality, because some inequalities are expected, like we expect the health of younger people to be better than an aging population. Um, but addressing health inequities that face our, our bodies that exist in our communities and can be seen in the state of our planet is vital to our survival with good health outcomes. And this circled ba circles back to housing, because um, to feel safe, it's not just physical, it's also mental. Um, and having a clean, stable place to live really uh, allows for people with this housing first approach, right? Like getting a house show, there's been, I'm getting excited. Um, having a house is, uh, has been shown to uh, have people, people access services more when they have a house, right? It's been, it's been shown that, that people can, can get these services that they need to uh, thrive uh, physically or mentally when they have a house because like Elizabeth was saying it's impossible to 
do that without it. Um, a home is essential for people to relax and settle in and reach success, right? Um, and the safety is furthered by our community um, that we make with, with our homes. Um, as I talked about social connectedness. Um, and then our relationships are, are really important um, with other people in our communities. And this all comes down to the planet that we live on, right? Um, the affordable housing crisis is such a huge issue because uh, there's all these homes that are too unaffordable or we're not able to build the homes in the right way, um, which is why I like our model that takes existing homes and um, uh, leases them out. Um, I'm kind of rambling around here, but I hope I'm answering the question. Um, no, you, you, that, you definitely are. Yeah. And then I'll pull in John into the discussion because as Elizabeth yeah. was giving her answer, she went to housing, but she also went more macro to, to planet. So from a climate, you know, standpoint there, you know, what does it mean to feel safe, body, community, and planet? And what is the intersection between these three spaces to you, John? Well, well, let me just start off by talking about my own experience. So to me, uh, feeling safe in my body means I've got some warm place to live. I've got uh, physical and social needs met. And because of my privilege, I have those things. And I'm, I'm grateful to have them. But at the same time, recognizing that there are so many people that don't. And, and Elizabeth, a little earlier, made the point that the more we have to struggle with our mere survival, the less we can be concerned with addressing social problems. And that goes right up the ladder. Uh, so if, if uh, there's civil unrest in a community, even people who are community leaders are confronted with just dealing with this civil unrest and the causes of what the problems are get pushed to, pushed to the back. So being secure, safe in the body is foundational to the better stuff that we can do. Okay, um, community, having a circle of friends, family, like-minded people, a sense that we are not alone is so critically important. And then the third thing is, uh, what does it mean to feel safe in the planet? Full disclosure here, I do not feel safe in this planet. Uh, I, I'm sad that that's the case. I've got kids, I've got grandkids. I see that that same kind of sadness is impacting and affecting their lives. So when we come to the intersection of these things, uh, and once again, referring back to Elizabeth's point that when people are under stress, they can't address these higher level problems. What I hope, what I see that we have to be doing right now is we have, those of us who can, need to be politically active, we need to be raising our voices, we need to be joining our voices with other people who are willing to raise their voices. One of the things I say on my radio program every once in a while is get active and raise hell. And I, we, we do that as a means of getting attention to a world that is often sleepy. I love that. And, and Stormy, as I come to you, one of the, I love this discussion. And what's great is, you know, everyone works on their own things. And sometimes we can get siloed and, and hyper-focused on what our objectives and goals are. But you're watching this kind of Venn diagram of how all these things intersect and how naturally folks are making those connections. More of it, more of it. So Stormy, you know, uh, you know, what does it mean to feel safe, body, community, and planet? And what is the intersection between those three spaces to you, body, community, and planet? Um, yeah, so I think for most of my life, you know, I've been, uh, it's kind of been indoctrinated, I guess, that to feel safe is, you know, those three basic needs, food, shelter, water. Um, and there are so many people around the world that don't have those things, you know, regularly. So I think, on a deeper level, um, safety is having a healthy spirit. Um, and that's not physical, you know, there's nothing physical about your spirit. And um, this is just my beliefs. I don't wanna um, offend anybody with that. Um, but I think to, you know, if you look at um, a homeless community there, they don't have, you know, a good shelter or they might not have food every day um, or these things that 
so many of us take for granted. Um, but so many of them are, I would say, um, content in who they are and, um, you know, almost even happy, you know, I've seen them singing and dancing and, you know, smiling and they have this sense of community. They have a connection, um, not all of them, but, you know, there's these communities where they are there for each other and they you know, they're their own kind of little family. And I think that that feeds their spirit enough to where they feel, um, they feel okay to be here. You know, they don't feel like, um, necessarily they don't have a place in world in this world because just because society says this is how the world is supposed to look doesn't mean that it's you know supposed to look like that for everybody um and so i think that is the basic for me in my opinion that is the basic um sense of safety is to have a, a healthy spirit and to feed that with connection with other people um, and with connection to our planet because that has been lost for centuries you know and you know my people know that with the you know colonization of our territories we lost the connection of our our places and our kinship ties with other tribes um, and so that's something that we have been working for you know since to to get those things back and to teach our children about those things um and so i think really um this kind of sense of place and um just being knowing who you are and um fitting in where you are i guess is is kind of the first the first step to that um and that's not to say that, you know, the food, shelter, water isn't important because that is, you know, that is vital for, for survival. Um, but uh, I think a healthy spirit is really kind of that interconnectedness of how, how we relate to each other and how we relate to our world. And um, yeah. You know, um, I was at a conference with uh, Front and Center last week and there was a uh, presentation and, and dialogue uh, with First Peoples. And one of the things that I, I didn't really have an understanding of the concept was we understand sovereignty, but there was a, a conversation centered around self-sovereignty and how important that is. Uh, and it really impacted me to the point where I want to kind of change the mission of my organization. But Dion, uh, you know, talk about it from your point of view, what does it mean to feel safe, body, community, and planet? Because that self-sovereignty is what I think when I think of body. Uh, and what is the intersection between these three spaces, uh, body, community, and planet to you? Yeah, just to respond to what you just offered up, Cam or Marwan, um, the self-sovereignty piece is important, but there's also, there are communities that are also fighting for their sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So like the tribal nations, each of the tribal nations is advocating for self-sovereignty, for tribal sovereignty, for self-governance. And then we have communities that are um, disadvantaged in terms of economic or historical standing, and they're fighting to not have the pollution dumped in their backyard. So this sovereignty piece is, is tied to the question you're asking. To me, my body is where I live and only I live here. And then there's my house where I live with roommates or family. And some people share it with, you know, other, other more extended groups. And then there's the planet and we live with everybody. The planet is. So I think that the, the thing is it's increasing in terms of who we have to negotiate with at every level beyond our body. So this is where bodily autonomy for me becomes really important. I'm the only one who's here. This is my space. I make the decisions here. So long as I do not harm others, this is this is my home. This is where I live in this body. And then there's my house. And um, that's, you know, more relationships, more negotiation. So at each level, having um, that autonomy piece, that that sovereignty piece where we have the ability to make decisions, but recognizing that the further we go outside of our body, there are others that we're living with and we need to be having those conversations and negotiating those those uh agreements those standards that we have for for how we're living and i think this is where the equity work becomes really important 
because we have whole populations that have long been disenfranchised from that conversation. They haven't had a voice and yet they have often been um, the most imposed upon in terms of their sovereignty and their rights. And I think that's, that's really crucial is that we give an increased voice to those communities now and that we sit back and listen and learn. And I, I love working with the tribes because I, my learning is exponential when I listen to the wisdom of the tribes and the tribal leaders and the elders and this preserved cultural value system that each of the tribes has, which are different from tribe to tribe, but they're these cohesive value systems that are much more intact than the, the system that I was raised in, which was in Colorado and Wyoming and, you know, German, Danish. It, it was this mix of European cultures, but no one culture was preserved. It was a diluted form of all of those different belief systems. So the safety, I think, between all of them comes in terms of that sovereignty, but also the communication, the peaceful communication, the mediation, negotiation, to have a role in making those decisions and making sure that it's an equal role for everyone who is sharing in that space. You know, I appreciate that. And, you know, we're coming up, we got about 15 minutes left. I know people are chomping at the bit to ask questions and, and jump in there. Uh, you know, there is a great quote from Vincent Tinto, and he says, access without support is not opportunity. Uh, and that's something that uh, just kind of is cycling in my mind uh, during this conversation here. But what I want to hear from is what are some of the challenges that your organization or work are currently facing and trying to adjust, address? And I'll go to you first, John. I'm sorry, who did you say is next? You. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sleep at the switch. No, not really. So... Um, there's a guy named Dan Ariely. He's a behavioral economist. Uh, he's a brilliant guy. He's on YouTube. I encourage anybody who's so inclined to check him out. One of the things that he said was that if we were to design a problem that human beings were uniquely disqualified from solving, it would be climate change. One of my beliefs is if if the worst climate change gets. And I mean, by winning the war on climate change is gone. Now we're, we're just talking about, okay, how far are we going to let it go before we really step in and take the action that we need to? The worse things get with the climate, the more challenged we're going to be all over the world with human rights. So I think that that's just a key issue in a CCL, Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, we're politically active, as our name implies, lobbying. I mean, my group met with Derek Kilmer, the representative from our area, a few days ago. We meet with him a couple, three times a year, sometimes in person, sometimes on Zoom, working on getting legislation through the U.S. Congress that is going to help in uh, our struggle regarding climate change. And I think it's absolutely critical that this stuff does happen at the federal level, that these decisions are political. If we just sit back, uh, things are, are not going to take care of themselves. And the free market is not going to solve these problems. And so we do have to be politically active. So a part of that is opening up channels of communication between people with differing worldviews, uh, developing public awareness, uh, striving to be reality-based. My Citizens Climate Lobby does a lot of research work so that when we talk about something, uh, we're on pretty solid ground when we talk about it. And the, the bottom line is actually part of our slogan is that our solution to climate change is democracy. So we are working very hard to make democracy work in this country. I appreciate that. Reality-based. <laughs> Uh, Crazy enough idea could work. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> what, what Dion was talking about, you know, learning from every space and, and how it's, you know, so powerful. So I like that. Stormy, uh, how about you? What challenges is your organization or work currently facing and how are you addressing it? Um, 
I think, well, I think our biggest, uh, since, you know, time immemorial has been land loss. Um, and so that's something, land is a commodity that is very limited. I mean, we don't, you know, we're not getting any more of that. So um, my tribe has been buying some land as we can. Um, we work with some of the timber companies um, so that we kind of get a first opportunity to, to purchase masses of land um, as it comes available. Um, and so that's really, um, that's so important because we also face um, a housing deficit here. Um, you know, we have so many tribal members who aren't able to um, live here on the reservation because we don't have enough housing. Um, so with that land, we're able to build more houses um, when we get the funding. <laughs> um, so as that comes in, um, and also part of that is being able to, um, you know, preserve the lands that we have. So we have, um, forested areas, you know, that we keep those, what they're going to be left as, they're going to be, you know, as forested areas um, that won't be developed. And part of that is to be able to teach, um, you know, kind of restore it back to how it should be, um, you know, with a diverse um, ecosystem there, but that will enable us to um, kind of teach our future generations about these plants that aren't so easy to find, um, you know, our medicines and things like that. Um, and an, another kind of uh, piece that we've been missing, and it kind of goes along with that spiritual piece is um, kind of our language and our stories. Um, so we have been working really hard to um, get our language back. Uh, we have a few language keepers um, and they're teaching others. So hopefully we'll have more. Um, our kids, my kids um, learn our language um, in school. You know, they start uh, down here at the Early Childhood Center at six weeks old. And uh, my son, he's five, he'll be graduating this year, going on to kindergarten. But he, you know, he's been learning the language in our songs since he was a baby. Um, and that's something that I didn't get because um, I didn't grow up here. And so, um, that's really important. Um, as Native peoples, we think about our future generations. And so um, having access to more housing and getting some of our lands back is, um, is a really vital piece of kind of who we are and making sure that we're keeping, keeping who we are. Um, so. Dion, let me uh, come to you. You know, what challenges is your organization and work currently facing or addressing? Yeah, so with the with the tribe, um, I would say self-governance and sovereignty advocating for those two and um, ensuring that the treaty rights are honored and that the general public is educated and aware of those and, and respecting them. But that in terms of federal and state funding, the obligations that the governments have to the tribes are being honored. Um, and with all the other organizations that I work with, I would say equity, getting a grasp on what the equity work entails, um, getting buy-in from all those who need to be on board and doing it and getting it in process. I think that, I think that almost everybody is struggling with that one right now. Absolutely. Uh, Elizabeth, you know, same question for you. You know, what challenges is your organization or we're currently facing or addressing? Um, a lot like, uh, what, uh, I mentioned earlier, just the, the inundation of information that's not <laughs> accurate about, um, the healthcare for the gender diverse, right? So especially youth, um, and one of the methods to combat that is provide the care, have the good outcomes and like provide information, help check assumptions and, work in that way um come into that space where it's like i would like to give you the information that will help that will help our youth that will help your youth right like going to that going into those dialogue situations like here's how this will help here's what this the benefits are and trying to meet that in a compassion as compassionate a way as possible while advocating for the rights of the underserved and historically oppressed um 
So it's, it's an information game. And sometimes you're not as ahead as you'd like to be. <laughs> Absolutely. Madison, let me come to you and ask you this. And uh, I, I don't, I don't rank the questions, but the last one is one of my favorites because it, it talks about what we're going to do, uh, what we can do. But before we get there, uh, again, Q&A will be after this. Uh, what challenges is your organization or work currently facing or trying to address? Um, uh, thank you for asking this question. Um, I think one part is ideological, right? Um, I loved when Stormy was talking about kind of a strengths-based perspective. Um, I think there's this temptation to other people experiencing homelessness, and that's really harmful. Um, it's tempting to have this paternalistic view of people who are experiencing the world different than us in a way that we maybe wouldn't want to experience the world. Um, but we all get by and we all survive. And so it's really important to remember the strengths of every person. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, when we're we're thinking about people who, like I said, are experiencing the world uh, different than us. Um, organizationally, this kind of ties into the what individuals can do, if that's okay. Um, Go ahead. Uh, we uh, have house managers, like I said, for each of our homes. And um, one of the things we struggle with is finding volunteers to do that goal. So if you're interested in being a house manager and helping us out, um, you can email me, madison.rosak at kitsaphoc.org. Um, I, I would love to, you know, get some more volunteers on board and help us out. Um, so thank you for letting me plug that. Oh, absolutely. Well, that's a perfect segue into the, our next question. And I will, I'm going to have you restate it too, because I think that's really important. So volunteerism uh, is, is a great way to get involved and, and to make that change. Uh, so what can we do as individuals, everyone? And where can we go to find out more? You know, what resources would you recommend? Elizabeth, I'll come to you first. Well, there are a lot. Um, there are a lot and not as many as we would like them to be. Um, as individuals, um, doing our own research, um, finding accessible research. Um, when I say doing our own research, that's that's a mixed bag. But like checking in with if you have um individually doing things as compassionately as possible if you have gender diverse loved ones making sure that you are being as affirming as possible making sure that we are cultivating that healthy space for folks to want to confide in us right like hey I know that we've been close. This is what I want to tell you. These are the pronouns that I use that I might not have introduced myself with before. Um, but now I feel like we have that safe relationship, making safe relationships as individuals for people to want to talk to us. Um, when looking for um, mental health professionals, looking for folks who are gender affirming, if you have folks that are also looking for resources, um, Again, Medicaid in Washington State, for those um, who might work with folks on Medicaid, does um, provide gender affirming care. Uh, the requirements are on the healthcare authority's website for their trans health program. Um, like, what do you need to do to access care? Um, hormone therapy is available to adults on an informed consent basis, so you don't necessarily need a behavioral health letter to access that care, which is good to know. Um, Planned Parenthood helps provide that care um, locally. And they do accept Medicaid. So um, the local community behavioral health providers um, in Kitsap also provide some gender affirming services um, for existing clients. So for folks who are coming in, not necessarily um, just to access gender diverse care, but are also looking for therapy services. Um, so that is also exciting. And those are our local resources. Um, for bigger resources, check me out at 1245. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I love it. All right, Stormy, for you, you know, what, what can we do as individuals? Where can we go to find out more on what resources exist and what would you recommend? Um, so I think just from a tribal perspective, um, I'm a huge advocate of education. And so 
wherever I go or whenever I have the opportunity to tell people about, um, you know, my tribe and our needs, I try to do that. Um, it's really astonishing the stereotypes that are still out there, you know, um, so many people don't know that tribes still exist or that we, you know, that we're, we're still here and we do not live in teepees on the West Coast. <laughs> um, so just education, really. Um, I know in my position and many of those who work at the tribe, their door is always open. Um, their phone line is always open. So if somebody has questions um, or just wants to know like really anything about the tribe, um, you know, just to reach out. Um, and I think, you know, from a governmental perspective, um, you know, that whole sovereignty thing, tribal government is, so much different than any of our local governments or even our federal government. Um, and so we're really always trying to work to keep those connections um, together and so that we are able to get the things that we need um, and that, um, you know, we, for me personally, um, you know, living here on the reservation, it's our own little community. Um, and there's a lot of people who, lived you know they've lived here their whole lives and they don't leave this you know they've never lived kind of in the outside world so to speak um and so for me I love to be able to try to connect those people with resources outside um so I think I'm on that search too you know for those same resources um uh but yeah just just connection um communication I think is you know, the most important thing um, for on our side and, you know, outside too. Connection, communication. John, what can we do as individuals? Where can we go to find out more? What resources would you recommend? Well, first off, I, I really do, the problems that we're facing uh, have their solution in politics. So to me, that means that we have to join with like-minded people and we have to be willing to raise our voices and to be effective, we have to be clear-eyed and um, we have to be willing to listen to other people. So I think that that's, as individuals, we join with others and we do a good job of influencing the political process locally, nationally, across the world, as far as that goes. <clears throat> as far as uh, where to find out more, especially talking about climate change, this is a huge challenge because there is an incredible amount of disinformation out there and so we have to be very, very careful. Now, I'm, I'm as ideological as the next guy. I like to read stuff that confirms what I already believe. It feels good. And to read something that challenges what I believe doesn't feel so good. But I, I think it's important for us, and I work at this, to, to expose myself to media that is different from what my let's call it my favorites the stuff that just tells me what what i already know and says yeah john you're right on target there to be challenged like that and that's a part of uh being clear-eyed uh, there are there are ways to get good climate information that, that's really not too tough uh, there are organizations like um the journal of the american medical association People love their doctors. They believe in their doctors. The Journal of American Medical Association writes about the impacts of climate change all up and down the spectrum all the time. So there are sources out there where we can get accurate information. So just a quick word about social media. We all know that social media is a wild, wild west. I'm on social media a lot. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. And so they are valuable tools. You just have to be very, very careful about what you take as fact. And there are some great resources on the internet for debunking uh, climate falsehoods, let's call it. There's a, uh, maybe we'll have an opportunity to leave some resources later on uh, for folks to look at after the fact. There's a website called DSmog, which is the place to go to check out, is this true, is this not true? Uh, how is this person who's saying this? What acts are they grinding? Where are they getting funded? Uh, and things like that. So um, join with other people and be really careful with the media that you absorb and be willing to have your own ideologies challenged. And I'll put it in terms of me. I will be willing to challenge my own ideological perspectives. I love that. I love that. 
All right, last answer before we go into our Q&A. Dion, uh, what can we do as individuals? And, you know, where can we go to find out more? What resources would you recommend? Yeah, so as individuals, uh, I personally, I recommend assuming that your position is wrong <laughs> and asking questions with that assumption um, because that's when we're really open and can hear what others are saying. Mm. And be curious, the internet, I mean, you can find resources on anything you want to at this point with the internet and accessibility that we have there. Um, the Pew Research uh, studies are phenomenal on any issue. They cover all of this. They recently did an excellent one on abortion and I would recommend that. And follow the links. Anytime you find an article or a study you like, follow the links in the article. It leads you to a whole bunch of other really excellent stuff. Um, on equity, of course, locally, we have the Kitsap County Council for Human Rights webpage. We have phenomenal resources on there and a recent timeline update that was done by Elizabeth, actually, that gives a ton of information about the history of human rights in our county, here where we live. And the Seattle City Government has the Racial Social Justice Initiative, which is, it's revolutionary in the entire country. It's phenomenal. Go look at the resources they have on there. And um, beyond that, the Othering and Belonging Institute down at Berkeley is, they have a ton of resources that are great. The Race and Pedagogy Institute, which is here in the Pacific Northwest. GARE, the Government Alliance for Race and Equity. One of the best trainers up here, Equity Trainers is sole focused group, in my opinion, phenomenal training for organizations working on it. The Racial Equity Initiative and Shakti Butler down in, um, Oakland with the the World Trust. I mean, I I, I personally find that studying equity uh, work with Black women is the most transformative, life enriching, uh, soul growing way to examine life in general, but especially equity work. So I highly recommend Shakti Butler and her work. And then with respect to the environment, the Community Environmental League Defense Fund has phenomenal resources on their website, celdf.org. And they're doing a lot of work with the rights of nature movement and working with tribes and some cities and passing rights of nature ordinances that are um, policy-wise implementing these protections for nature. And the Earth Law Center is excellent as well. And um, yeah, follow the resources on any of those. And it's a rabbit hole of phenomenal research and information that you can spend the next year going down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what the word of the day is, but uh, soul growing is definitely an awesome one. I love that. So we're going to transition into our Q&A time. We're going to take the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, as questions come in, I'll ask the, the panel to, to try to be succinct so we can take as many questions as possible. I do want to give you guys a quick pause. Pause there. You know, appreciate you all. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and transition into our Q and A section. And that I will undoubtedly, I don't know if those are gonna come into the chat. I have I... enabled the chat for this purpose. <laughs> oh, you have, okay. Yes. So the chat is now enabled. Please go ahead and type your questions into the chat. And I see Ace has his hand up also. Okay. So then we can go to, are, are people able to, to also speak Elizabeth or does Ace need to type in the chat? Ace can unmute uh, himself. Oh, so awesome. Hello. 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 Can you hear me now? We can. Excellent. Um, my name is Ace Haynes. I was elected the Republican precinct committee officer for Precinct 460. Uh, it's been an insanely uphill battle, uh, as much as everyone would like to believe that our politicians are great and they'll be working for you, uh, they won't. Uh, I've actually had the Kitsap County Auditor remove the election results where I was elected and he asked the Kitsap County Republican Party to appoint someone in my place. So uh, all of that wonderful talk about how we can be disenfranchised through any number of means uh, yeah, even if you win an election, the Kitsap County Auditor will remove you. Um, furthermore, you know, since running for office, I have experienced the opposite of what John was talking about, 
uh, once you go out in the community and you engage people uh, uh, writ large level, uh, they will go ahead and make you not safe at home and force you to retreat. So that's the community we live in. And I would just like to share my experience uh, before we go forward today. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, Ace. Does anyone want to respond to that here on the panel in regards to um, how can we change uh, and, and create that safety so people can engage? Because that's kind of been, again, one of the through lines of this discussion is, is coming together. And, and while they other... think about that for a second, uh, Stormy, you're doing a great job. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, so ahead, I'll, I'll, I'll just comment real quickly if I could. And that Thank is, uh, I'm certainly um, sympathetic to Ace's uh, ex experience, his story there. And the reality is that we live in a horribly uh, partisan world these days. And um, his experience is certainly not a unique one in terms of uh, not being able to bridge communication divides and to come to some kind of civilized um, uh, understanding. So that takes me back to a theme that I've talked about to an extent here, and that is those of us who are capable of bridging divides, we need to work really hard at that. And, you know, there's an expression that says all great victories were almost great defeats. And so we can't minimize the challenge of what Ace was talking about there. The only solution, it's like if you got to drain a lake and all you got is a bucket, well, you better get your bucket and you better start draining the lake. So it's a big task. Let's get to it. Yeah, and I would say better off if you can get a thousand people to grab buckets and help you. You're going to make <laughs> progress more quickly. Um, but beyond that, I, I think, Ace, that, that this is happening all over the country and it's happening to Democrats in highly Republican areas and Republicans in the highly Democrat areas. And the reality is, and I, I bump up against this all the time myself, particularly in the sustainable uh, building and development realm, we collectively have laws and rules and we abide by those. And if we disagree with them, we abide by them until we are able to change them. So my recommendation is to look at the policies or laws that are being cited for the uh, reason for the exclusion of the election results. and. Uh, work on changing them. And if they aren't being cited, or if the uh, if you believe that the results are are just not being honored, talk to the media. Talk that the media is the fourth, the fourth arm of government. It is the the way that we get those problems out there. So yes. I I would do I that. I just found out about this this Monday. They didn't notify me or anyone for that matter. They didn't tell anyone in the public or the media. So that is where we are at now. You guys are at the front lines of, of learning about this issue. Um, I was going to come here and talk about schools, and I've been sidetracked by my own issue this week. So we're going to take questions right now. But Ace, if you'd like to come to a council meeting and raise the concern and ask for uh, support, if you believe it's a human, right, human rights violation, you certainly are able to do that. And the public is always able to join us for our monthly meetings if they have any concerns of that nature. Thank you. As an aside in the chat, I know, Peggy, you have a question real quick. Um, Helen uh, mentioned that there are some grassroots LGBTQ organizations outside of behavioral health um, for families and friends of gender diverse folks. Um, there's Trans Friends on Bainbridge, um, which is a really big one. Kitsap Pride also has its own stuff um, in July. Uh, so I wanted to plug that real quick. Um, Absolutely. So if there are more questions, you can either type them in the chat or you can also uh, raise your hand and come off of mute. In the interim, Dion, would you be willing to drop that list of resources, uh, organizations in the chat uh, for folks? That would be tremendously helpful. The list I gave? Yes. Yeah, well, and I'll tell you this too. So I've been gathering equity training type resources for about three years now, and I think it's three pages long. If anybody wants that list of resources, uh, you can email me and I'll put my council related email in the chat window. And I'll be happy to share that with anybody who is looking to uh, step into equity work and not spend the many, many hours that I did. <laughs> well, I know I definitely want that list. 
as we're waiting for more questions to come in. Um, Marwan, can yeah. I ask a question? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, I noticed um, that the conference didn't open with a land acknowledgement, and I was just wondering about the analysis behind that. I can and, respond. Okay. Peggy, I can respond to that. There, the council actually had a huge meeting on this a couple of months ago and has decided to suspend those for right now. And that is after a uh, conversation with tribal members and the, the need to look more deeply at what's going on with land acknowledgements. I don't know if you're following the news articles that are coming up, but there's there, there are a lot of concerns about them becoming a token acknowledgement that's done and nothing else is considered beyond that. And there are a lot of tribes and tribal members who are asking for something more meaningful and, and in fact feel that the land acknowledgements are potentially damaging, that they're allowing white people to get rid of their guilt by doing this acknowledgement and then doing nothing more. So we are looking more deeply into that and working with both of our Kitsap area tribes to figure out what that looks like and how we, how we um, are more respectful, more honoring, and more authentic in the work that we're doing in that regard. Thanks, Dion. I, I hope that you'll be sharing um, that as you go through that process with the tribes, because also I know kids up a race and um, Bainbridge React and, and everyone else is kind of curious. And we're still doing them because mm -hmm. I've talked to some tribal members that like them. And, you know, so it's, you know, I realize tribal people are not monolithic, but um, I'd be interested in hearing the process as you go forward. Thank you. And I, I'm hoping, Peggy, that there'll be a forum sometime in the next several months uh, to discuss that and to figure it out. Uh, that's great. Thank you for that. Uh, no, thank you for that didn't. question. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm got the chat here. I can see it. Ellen Minutes, if you want to come off of mute and ask your question or make a comment. I just wanted to make some comments. I'm probably one of the oldest people here, and I can remember the 70s and the free to be you and me thing with Marlo Thomas and William has a doll. That was one of the songs she sang. And I I also uh, belong to the Ms. group in Charleston, South Carolina. It was the first group meeting I went to. And they also um, had a magazine, Ms. magazine that I took. And that's how I raised my kids to believe. <laughs> so I'm glad it's still going on. It's really improving everything, gender, Fluid is really good now. And Marwan, I see Pe uh, Maria has her hand up and then Sheldon has asked a question in chat that I would be happy to take if um, yeah, let me Let me ask the question first and then we'll take the, the comment. So the question from Sheldon is, if rights are the framing for this discussion, how important is addressing white supremacy in law institutions for us to address climate change and bodily autonomy. What are your, what are approaches that you have seen uh, as successful to dismantling white supremacy? And thank you for the question. And uh, Maria had her hand up first. So I just wanna offer to Maria if she would like to ask her question first. Thank okay. you. Uh, I can't so, see that. so it's more of a, an ask than a question. So Dion, you brought up a very important thing as far as uh, length acknowledgements. Uh, there is a uh, different viewpoint from different tribal members, and I think both need to be honored. Um, and having that discussion openly with a lot of organizations with tribal leadership and members present, I think is uh, very important for us to, as a county uh, and county uh, leaders, to know how we acknowledge them in a way that is respectful and not performative. Uh, those who came to the first mm -hmm. Health Equity Collaborative uh, know that Jessica had the land acknowledgements on the screen, but she verbally stated that we weren't reading them because of the fact that we have heard from some tribal members that they find it performative and we don't want to offend, but we definitely do want to acknowledge. Um, and so it's an important conversation that we have. So hopefully it might even make it to the next Human Rights Conference because it's a, a discussion worthy of a lot of investment. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Sheldon had asked a question about um, addressing the white supremacy and laws and institutions. And this is huge. And this is the crux of everything that I think we're working on as a nation right now. So our entire structure is colonial. The legal system, the way we drafted our laws, the way our Congress and everything works, it's all colonialism. It's all imported from um, the very nation that we were leaving, England. And so, and that that's not an opinion. That's acknowledged by scholars. That's that's where it came from. We We replicated those systems. And so they are literally embedded, that, that structure is literally embedded. It's the foundation of everything that was built on top of it again. So when we talk about how we are addressing that, that um, fundamental underlying white supremacist, slave owning culture, it's this is crucial. And how do we do it without tearing down the whole system and yet do it meaningfully? And I don't have the answer, Sheldon. <laughs> if I did, I wish I did. I don't have it. And this is where all of us coming together collectively and respectfully hearing each other, and especially those who are the most disenfranchised among us. And, you know, I, I know statistically, when we look at it, we always talk about the, uh, the rates of everything, everything negative that happens to our Black community members. But Native Americans are actually even higher rates than our Black community members. It's just that the Native American community is a smaller percentage of the population. So to me, it's most crucial that we have our Black community members and our Native American community members at the table at every conversation, that they're paid for their time for being there, that they're compensated for giving their perspective and helping us to dig into this because I, I, I don't see how we're going to do it without that involvement and having them lead the way and showing us how to get there. And if I can make a comment. Um, mm -hmm. I think that an important part of this conversation is having the conversation and identifying different parts of white supremacy culture, like I mentioned, paternalism, um, perfectionism, the right to comfort, you know, doing research and identifying in your life where these things come up and where you can make a change and uh, having this discussion with other people at your work, in your life, and just addressing that this is an issue and educating on how we can make changes is a really important part of dismantling white supremacy culture. I don't know if Sheldon wants to respond at all, but I notice Aaron Leidick also has up his hand. And Aaron, as you all know, received the Linda Gabriel Award today. And I, I hand off to Aaron because Aaron has wisdom beyond what I have about this process work and has been involved in it for a lot longer than I have. Aaron? Hey, everyone. Looking hey. good. Congratulations. I'm off video because my connection is kind of spotty, but it's good to see you. Um, I love Sheldon's question and everything everybody said has been so good. I, I wanted to um, just, you know, pick back everything everybody has said and, and also um, mention that, you know, some of our institutions that are built on those norms of white supremacy do, some of them, do now have bodies that they've formed to um, look internally at their systems and structures and do that anti-colonial analysis, do that anti-racist analysis and see what would the rebuilding look like. Um, I know, you know, I serve on one of those, the Race Equity Advisory Committee for City of Bremerton. And I also believe that when those bodies get formed, there's usually a period of time and sometimes it's decades where there's just a constant push um, to actually make those things effective because there can be sort of a sense of, yeah, let's form these bodies, but the status quo of the institution um, resists the bodies looking inward and actually examining the system of governance, for example, with the city of Bremerton or public health, you know, with, with that, and instead might encourage those bodies to do things like hold cultural celebrations for the jurisdiction. Cultural celebrations are wonderful. That's not a bad thing but it doesn't look internally at the way systems are structured, right? So I, I just will encourage everyone, um, you know, let's talk about where are those bodies already existing and where they don't exist. Let's get them started. Let's make sure there's empowered community members on there 
And we're all like asking the folks who are serving, how's it going? How can we have your back? Do you need us to show up to meetings? Do you need us to write letters? Do you need us to like stop in the mayor's office or go to public health? What should we do? Um, but it's, I think it takes us all kind of perpetually showing up and saying, we want to look at the system. We want to break it down. We want to build something new. Just establishing the body is ain't going to get it done, right? Um, and this is where that collectivity of how we all show up. And I think about things like Marwan just is everybody watching Marwan's show? Are you seeing the things that he's bringing out about what's happening in these institutions? Basically, he's delivering it to you in a in a beautiful package. You can hear his show, get updated on the news. He'll tell you how to show up to the next meeting, stuff like that. Um, we can feel the power of community and the excitement of doing that work. We don't all have to each individually research all these things, right? We can do it collectively in community and just have the relationships. So when somebody says, hey, like Dion says, hey, I need y'all to come to the Council of Human Rights meeting because we're going to have the chance to speak to the commissioners. Boom, she can get 200 of us to show up in a meeting and, and we the institution can see community is ready to do this work alongside you and rebuild this thing. So um, just when something happens and it's inside an institution, that's not the stopping point. That's the very first step. So um, let's let's follow that up. Thanks for letting me speak. Thank you, Aaron. There's a couple comments in the chat. Uh, one, addressing what can one person do uh, to mitigate climate change. One might read the 2019 Eat Lancet Commission report and its Q6 month updates, which look deeper into social justice. Uh, Ace says this conversation about the land acknowledgement is better than just reading it again. Uh, another question here, does anyone know if any organizations in Kitsap County are looking at bringing training about or facilitating community conversations uh, to bridge divides. I have heard about Braver Angels has a good process, but need to learn more about them. Anyone have an answer to that on our panel here? So at first I wanna say that we have a whole bunch of great workshops this afternoon and some of the things that we're talking about here are gonna be touched on in those. So I hope that people will choose to return or stick around for some of those workshops. Um, the rest of the day. <clears throat> and um, the Dispute Resolution Center is doing facilitation training and doing circle uh, groups that facilitate some of those conversations. But no, Jessica, I, I haven't heard of anything more that's happening yet. And I'm continuing to look for resources for that because I think that's a crucial next step is for us to have uh, a process and be trained in and have many of us within the community that are skilled in that. All right. Uh, another question here is what is Marwan show? It is called The Conduit and you can subscribe, like, and share on YouTube. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see, Paul's Bowl will have four city council seats up for election next year. Paul's Bowl for all uh, has experienced team and resources ready to get behind potential candidates who will truly go to work on equity in city government. Pam Keeley at Mac.com. Uh, Kids at Black Student Union will be doing some guided conversations soon. Stay tuned. We have a Facebook page under Kids at Black Student Union and IG under, which is Instagram, under Kids at BSU. We have about seven minutes left. More questions, comments? Anyone have their hand raised there, uh, Elizabeth or Dion? Because I can't see that. Nope, not right now. All right. So while we're waiting on some more questions to come in, and there's some links that are being put into the chat, so definitely want to capture that. Don't miss uh, the good conversation that's happening in the chat simultaneously. While we're waiting for other folks to type in the chat, uh, John, give us two things you believe are most important to take away from this conversation. And Marwan, we do have a hand up again. Oh, you do? Okay. Yes, Let's go Maria. to our hand. Thanks, Dion. Um, so I just want to build on the comment that you made, Dion, that sometimes we forget that other uh, <clears throat> community members are impacted by um, racism and white supremacy. And sometimes we just don't know because either their population is too small or because they're not very outspoken about it. Uh, but there was an article uh, just in the last couple of weeks that there were about 30 to 50 uh, parents and students who came to North Kitsap High School and talked about the racist uh, experiences that they were having both as students and as parents 
by uh, the way they were treated, resources that were not provided, comments that were made to belittle them in public, both from uh, students and staff, which is the saddest part to hear that that's coming from staff. Um, and so it's really important to have the conversation that, um, you know, to center one voice is to exclude all the other voices. And we're doing white supremacy again, right? Where we're doing a hierarchy of whose needs are more important for us to address. Excellent point. Absolutely. Uh, Elizabeth will be providing instructions on how to join the breakout sessions coming up after the break. Uh, BI Reads for Justice is organizing uh, conversations about race based around the book stamped by Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi. The group is using the living room conversations model and the first of the series worked quite well. All I right. actually have a question for someone that put something in the chat. In the chat. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Helen, you mentioned um, a local grassroots organization for um, trans folks on Bainbridge Island and their family members um, and their loved ones. I wanted to know if there was a specific point of contact for that because I can't find a website. Um, so I just want to make sure that for that resource, folks know who to get in touch with. Um, Anne Lovejoy is the person that organized it. And you can also um, find out through the Senior Center. There are a lot of activities at the Senior Center related to transgender um, support. Um, but Anne Lovejoy is the one that I get uh, email from every other week for um, one, every other week they do a Zoom and every other week they have a meeting at um, Eagle Harbor uh, Church in downtown Bainbridge. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yep. All right, folks are putting their emails in the chat. Uh, up from Slavery uh, Equity Summit is coming up again. I believe that was May 24th. Uh, Daryl mentioned, so I want to make sure that I mentioned that. I think I got most of the... Uh, questions and comments so far in the chat. I see Karen has a question. Uh, Go ahead, Aaron. Uh, Kuye, I think, has a question, right? Yes. Yes. Kuye. Hello. Hey, family. How is everybody doing today on this wonderful day? Um, one of the things that um, the Kitsap Erase Coalition uh, we've been working on diligently working on some of these initiatives, but the truth and reconciliation uh, from the Breaking Bread team, we are working with our commissioners as well to do some of this work. What that would entail was many of our BIPOC community members coming together to really visualize what that truth and reconciliation commission for our Kitsap County uh, would look like. And so that is um, up and coming on our calendar as well. Uh, Want to um, make sure that they know that the Kitsap Erase Coalition is working with city governments, working with faith-based organizations, as well as working with our uh, law enforcement. And um, so there are many different teams that are leading that up, our educational team. And so wanted to just make sure that everyone knew that each of those uh, different areas are distinctly working on um, what they will be focusing on in those specific areas. So wanted to make sure that that's out there and just connect if you're interested in what race equity looks like in the education, in the government, in the faith base, and with community engagement, that you all are aware of some of the work and initiatives that they're leading um, forward. All right, thank you for that, Akuye. And this will conclude our uh, discussion today. Again, shout out to our panelists here. <laughs> Appreciate you, that is from the conduit. Now I'm gonna pass it on to Elizabeth who will be providing instructions on how to join the breakout sessions coming up after the break. Okie dokie, I'm gonna unhighlight everybody so that I can pull up the slide with instructions um, because y'all are going to be able to pick your own 
um, breakout groups, which will be exciting. Um, so here are the instructions. Um, it's it's going to be manually done. I'm going to set up the breakout rooms um, during the break. Uh, so when y'all come back, this instruction slide will be up and the breakout rooms will be active. Um, so what you're going to be looking for is a little notification in your breakout room section at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, or the top, depending. And um, you'll see a window that'll look like this right here. Um, and all of y'all 